Hello, thanks uh, for joining us uh, for our 14th webinar on the pandemic series, which we now call Supervising the New Normal. I'm Bob Akapasade, CEO of Toronto Center, and I'm very excited for the conversation today uh, with uh, Carolyn Rogers and Paul uh, Andrews, which I will introduce in a moment. Since March 11th, when the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic in response, to the public health and economic crisis, most governments responded with lockdowns, extraordinary monetary and fiscal rescue measures, and unprecedented flexibility and supervision to help the financial system absorb the shock, remain sound, and keep providing crucial support to the real economy. We're now witnessing devastation in developing countries which do not have deep pockets, but still some developed jurisdictions are fighting the virus's resurgence only weeks after their economies reopen. So COVID-19 still rages on and is very much a uh, topical uh, matter for us. The crisis will have important implications for financial stability, financial inclusion, investor and depositor protection, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Toronto Centre has been providing a lot of support to supervisors and regulators through our business continuity planning uh, communities of practice and various resources such as TC notes and webinars. If you need more information, please go to crisis at torontocenter.org. International standard setters are not immune and are carefully monitoring the situation to ensure the global financial regulatory and supervisory community has a coordinated response. Today, we sit down with two prominent experts. As I mentioned, Carolyn Rogers is the Secretary General of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Paul Andrews is the Secretary General of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, or IOSCO. You have received their bios. At Toronto Center, we follow their work very closely and very much appreciate their hard work. Welcome, Carolyn. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. The Basel Committee and IOSCO are two key standard setters. They each have challenging, unique global coordination and consensus building mandates. To the extent that we can draw a commonality, their aim is to strengthen regulation, supervision, and practices of financial sector worldwide, which includes enhancing financial stability, and directly or indirectly, improving market integrity, investor and depositor protection. Please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen to post your questions. We will try our best to answer as many of them as possible. I also like to give a big thanks to our funders, Global Affairs Canada, Swedish CETA, the IMF, USAID, Jersey Overseas Aid, and Comic Relief, without whom we could not fulfill our mission. Also would like to thank uh, my team, Demet Chanakcha uh, and Diana Bird, who worked tirelessly to put this uh, event together. So let's just go to the questions right away. Carolyn and Paul, this is a question to both of you. So Carolyn, I'll ask you to go first and Paul after. Regulatory fragmentation has received a great deal of attention in the past few years, and the topic has once again been in the headlines out of concerns that international authorities would adopt measures to protect their national and jurisdictional interests, and that these measures will have a negative effect on global financial stability. Carolyn, is fragmentation and protectionism a concern for you? Thanks, Vivek. So just before I get started, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to you. and. Demet and Diana for, for your organizing and hello to all my fellow regulators and supervisors out there. I hope you're all safe and well. Um, so uh, I guess I would separate fragmentation from protectionism and I would say I worry more about fragmentation than I do about protectionism. I sort of think of protectionism as more of a concept applicable to trade and treaties and that the thing which isn't really uh, the same as what we do in terms of negotiating global financial standards. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll give you my view on fragmentation. I think that um, it's, a, it's a term that has become pretty common lately. And, and um, I think the banks use it a lot to lobby regulators. Um, my view about fragmentation is it generally arises from two things. Uh, one I would say is a sort of reasonable, legitimate thing and one not so much. So the reasonable and legitimate thing is I think most financial regulators, bank regulators at least, uh, uh, deposit-taking institution regulators, 
Um, we, in addition to our, our safety and soundness and stability mandates, we usually have a depositor protection mandate. And I know if I think back to my last job, um, certainly I thought of the broader stability and, and the broader safety and soundness of the banking system, but I always had in the back of my mind that I was responsible for the depositors and creditors of the banks that I regulated. And, and so I think that is the part of regulators' mandates that often lead them to the things that um, most banks draw out as fragmentation, so prepositioning capital or liquidity resources. So, so that I would sort of classify as, you know, perhaps an unfortunate outcome of regulation, but a difficult one to avoid. And I don't, I think it would be difficult to call that sort of unintended or, or um, something that we need to get rid of. Um, the other source of fragmentation that I think is more problematic um, usually comes quite honestly from the um, um, relentless lobbying that financial institutions do to their regulators and their governments to make the regulations customized to their market. And so they want special things done in their market. They want special exceptions. They want things reduced or changed or, or whatever in their market. And then you end up certainly with an unlevel playing field or you end up with fragmentation. And so usually when the banks talk to me about fragmentation, I tell them that they're, they're as positioned or better than I am to to reduce it so will it increase in this kind of environment i think i think that would be um reasonable to expect um in an environment like this particularly as we hopefully head into a recovery i think governments will be um looking for ways to support and to prop up and to even sort of um accelerate their economic recovery and we're going to be back to that age-old um push and pull of you know does lighter regulation meet an economic boost? So, so I think it's, it, it is something that I worry about, um, but I think we have to be careful when we think about fragmentation about what the source of it is. Thank you very much, Carolyn. I appreciate that answer. And uh, word over to you, Paul, is fragmentation and protectionism a concern for you? Well, uh, well, thanks. And, and, and let me begin very much like Carolyn. Thank you, Buck, and, and your colleagues for uh, the invitation. It's uh, my maiden voyage on, uh, on the Toronto Center, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So thanks very much uh, for, 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 the, for the kind invite. You know, I, I want to pick up on a couple of things that, that, that Carolyn said, because they're equally relevant to the way we look at it, I would say, at IOSCO. And long before I think this became sort of the buzzword uh, of, the, of the day, you know, we had picked up this issue uh, as something that we were going to focus on a couple of years ago. Um, and, and from our vantage point, it was really about unintended harmful fragmentation. And that means something I would say very different to regulators than it may to the industry. And you know, to Carolyn's point, I mean, we do hear from the industry uh, quite often. And uh, uh, early on in this uh, discussion and these debates, uh, we took up the issue as did the uh, Financial Stability Board and there were a series of round tables and talking to the industry, what did they mean about fragmentation and what's the concern and et cetera, et cetera. And without fail, in all of those round tables, what we heard for, as a regulator, now of course we have our own biases and we have our own perspectives and, and whatnot, but what we heard from industry participants was similar to what Carolyn was saying, which is, you know, in country X, you have this rule, and in country Y, you have that rule, and in country Z, you have this other rule, and you're killing us. We have to comply with this set of rules, and this set of rules, and this set of rules, and it's so burdensome, it's so costly, and you need to fix it. And, and that was their definition of a fragmentation, and harmful fragmentation was it was costing the industry money. And I don't want to minimize the impact that those kinds of uh, things have on the industry. Yes, it, it, it absolutely does. But from a regulator's point of view, those kinds of things fall on deaf ears. And I think the discussion really needs to, to turn a little bit about what is truly harmful about fragmentation that we're worried about 
how does it impact investor and investor and, and investors generally, investor protection perhaps more specifically, but also markets generally and market integrity? And I think if we can have that discussion, that would be a more fruitful way to go about it. So yes, am I concerned about it? I am concerned about it. And IOSCO is concerned about it as an organization and we've picked that up. And I hope we have a chance later to talk a little bit about some of the work we've done uh, in that area. But, but for now, let me leave it at, I'm, I am concerned about it, but perhaps slightly differently than maybe the industry is. Thank you very much to both of you for your answer and also the nuances you brought into it. I guess it's reassuring to hear that you are both not concerned about protectionism, right? In this day and age where a lot of the levers of internationalism are being pulled apart, at least in the financial sector, sounds like the organizations you lead, the standard setting, uh, have the robust architecture to be able to bring the world closer together rather than uh, dealing with uh, other things. Like look at the WHO and others who are dealing with countries trying to pull out or WTO, and at least you're immune to that, at least for now. So that's great. Before we go on, I just want to give a quick note that uh, we have participants from over 40 countries, uh, ranging from Argentina to Zambia, and every level of, letter of alphabet in between, and literally all continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America. So it's a very good turnout, 240 people registered. So Good for, for everyone. Carolyn, we have witnessed unprecedented flexibility in supervision. I referenced that in my um, opening remarks since the beginning of this pandemic. Is this temporary or do you see the pandemic leading to longer term fundamental or structural changes on how banks uh, are regulated and are supervised? Um, so I would say yes and yes. <laughs> so uh, I do do think the intention absolutely from our members on the policy measures that they've implemented uh, by and large most of them have been temporary and targeted measures that um, I think are made to deal with um, what is a, a pretty unique crisis um, and and so I do think that is the intention going in will that be difficult to maintain um, you know going back to my earlier comments about the pressure that will come um, when, when economies are trying to recover from this uh, shock. I think, I think it will be very difficult, but certainly the intention going in is that these are targeted and temporary measures. Um, but the last half of your question, Babaka, will there be long-term structural changes to how banks are supervised and regulated? I mean, I think that, uh, I think there likely will be, but I, I, I think it will come because I think there will be long-term structural changes to how banks operate after the crisis. I think we're going to see the business model. Going into the crisis, I think there were pretty fundamental changes happening to the banking business model. And some of the pressures that were creating those changes before the crisis, low interest rates, uh, the prolifer prol proliferation of technology, um, uh, those types of things, I think the crisis has accelerated. So I think banks are gonna fundamentally change. And so, good sound financial regulation of banks will have to change along with it. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, Paul, turning to you, for you to be able to talk a little bit about uh, your work at IOSCO. Implementation of the joint uh, BCSB IOSCO margin requirements for non-centrally cleared over-the-counter derivatives has been deferred due to the pandemic. Although this was warmly received by the industry and trade associations, do you think there is a risk that there will be strong pushback or insufficient motivation and appetite to prevent implementation of these uh, final phases? I mean, the short answer is I, I'm not really worried about that, uh, to be completely frank, um, for two reasons. I would say, number one, when we work together, Carolyn and I work together on this with our respective uh, governing bodies, to, to implement this delay. And we did it for a very specific reason, which was to alleviate some operational pressures on firms so that they could devote the time and attention that was necessary to address COVID-19. And it was the right decision back several months ago when we made it, and I think it, it remains the right decision today as we look back. So, so that was, we were very, very clear that we were not rolling back the requirement or any of the 
issues that were that gave rise to why those requirements came in, into place in the first in the first place. So that's one, the first reason why I'm not so worried about uh, pushback. But the other reason why is actually more practical and something that I will say surprised me a little bit, which was the criticism that we took for actually delaying the implementation. There were a number of market participants and there were press articles about this that criticized us for implementing that delay. And the rationale was, well, we made, as an industry, we made such a push to get to this September 2020 deadline. And then sort of several months ahead of time, you say, oh, forget, we're gonna pull back. And, and, and you're not taking into account the fact that we made all these preparations, we were pretty much ready to go. And, and now you said, don't, don't worry about it. And I guess it was surprising to me that, that we heard this type of criticism. And I think you know, our response to that was, well, you know, there's nothing stopping the industry from proceeding if they if they choose to do so. But the fact that we were trying to be, I think, good corporate citizens, you know, writ large and try to make accommodations given the pandemic, uh, it was it was sort of an interesting reaction, I thought. But at the end of the day, I'm not worried. I think the industry will be ready. I think they'll be there and I think they're well on their way. Thanks, Paul. I guess uh, could, if I could summarize uh, or paraphrase your answer, it could be no good deed will go unpunished, right? So, <laughs> so Carolyn, turning back to you again, uh, the Basel Committee and its governing body announced a delay or deferral for implementing some of the Basel III reforms. Similarly, uh, are you concerned that these temporary measures may become permanent? I guess you see a bit of a theme here, which is pandemic has really disrupted everything to what extent, and then we're all trying to reclaim the new normal one way or another. So to what extent you're concerned about that or what, what, how are you dealing with that problem? Yeah. Um, I wish I could, I wish I could be as sanguine as Paul. I'm worried. <laughs> um, uh, I, I already see a trend um, uh, in banks trying to, position the fact that they came into the crisis stronger and they're part of the solution not part of the problem there's all kinds of uh, marketing going on and now if only they had lighter regulation they could help so much more and uh, and I think um, I think that argument will find I worry that that argument will find fertile ground in governments who are desperate to stoke their economies um, so, so I am worried. Um, there has, you know, as I, I mentioned this earlier, there's long been this, I think, false narrative that regulation constrains economies. Uh, I, I think, you know, healthier banks support healthy economies. So um, that is a narrative that I think uh, will only uh, get fed um, by the COVID-19 arguments. So um, I, I think it's an ironic one. I mean, I think the fact you know, for a bank to say on one hand, I, I get to be part of the solution, I came into this stronger because I have more capital. And so now the obvious thing to do would be to let me have less capital. I just, I don't understand the argument, but, um, but it is being made. And, and I do think, as I said, I worry that it'll find favor. Um, but you know, like Paul said, we, we uh, it's interesting some of the, uh, some of what you get in terms of feedback. We made the, uh, deferral on the Basel, the final Basel III reforms, for the same reasons we made the deferral with IOSCO on the on the derivative um, reforms, and that was exclusively to free up operational capacity. So it was not a decision that we would uh, forbear on the capital requirements or anything like that. Uh, we made the decision because we knew that the operational effort to implement that last set of reforms was significant, not only for banks but for supervisors. And we knew that both banks and supervisors needed to be focused on the task at hand. And so it seemed a logical decision. But the fundamental requirements, you know, I mean, quite honestly, I think what we really felt is we regretted we hadn't got them in. So um, a really good example is, you know, there's a lot of fretting going on right now about procyclicality. And if we were off Basel II and on to Basel III, that conversation would be different. Uh, but we didn't quite get there. The credit risk uh, in most 
jurisdictions is still largely Basel II, and it does have some of the pro-cyclical elements. So, so I, I do, you know, I do worry, but I, I remain optimistic that, uh, that the final Basel III reforms will continue to hold um, and uh, will be implemented on time. Thanks, Carolyn. And, you know, a bit of worrying is very sobering and very needed. I mean, if for those of uh, the audience and others who are not steeped in banking regulation and the work that you do, I mean, the key thing to keep in mind is this pandemic, as it disrupted everything, supervisors like everybody else stepped in, brought a lot of flexibility to fold like our governments in terms of fiscal measures and anything short of that would have been unpatriotic. But now it's up to the financial institutions that really smeared their names back in the 2008 uh, global financial crisis and now have a chance to launder their name and reputations to also step up and do more work. So sorry about that commentary. I just couldn't resist <laughs> making a bit of that. I know that you will not be able to say comments like that. But anyway, Paul, turning to you, uh, IOSCO has just published its report entitled Good Practices on Processes for Deference, which is relevant to a previous report in 2019 relating to market fragmentation. Can you explain what those suggested good practices are and what IOSCO expects they may achieve in relation to market fragmentation issues? I'm well, very, very happy to, uh, to talk about that and I appreciate you, you bringing it up because it is a piece of work that we, that we just recently accomplished and, and frankly, we're, we're pretty proud of it. And, it and it does relate very much so to the market fragmentation uh, discussion we were having just a, just a couple of minutes ago. And, and essentially what, what the report that you referred to in 2019 did was, was lay out uh, what are some of the sources of fragmentation and what could be done to overcome fragmentation, at least from, from a capital markets regulation point of view. And in the 2019 report, we listed three approaches, one of which was to come up with good practices with respect to, to deference. And that's what this report that you just mentioned that we just published um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, are all about. And, and the idea was to, was to try to create a series of processes that would make the deference discussion more or less, I should say, frictionless. And so it wasn't about the politics of whether you should engage in a deference discussion. The discussion was if you choose to go down the deference road, what are the processes and procedures that you could use to help make the process easier, more efficient, and more effective? And that's what these good practices really uh, are, are attempting to do. And so in the, course of, in the course of putting them together, we looked at a range of, of, of different agreements that have been entered into, how they went about it, the, 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 what worked, what didn't work, and those kinds of things. And I think what we found was that the agreements and the work that we did, all of these deference discussions are really, or have been at least to date, based on you know, certain, let's call them philosophies, or certain uh, underpinnings. And those are you know, fairly obvious, but you know, just to, to tick them off, I mean, it, it, it's, it's about looking at outcomes as opposed to specific rules and trying to be an outcomes-based approach to, to how you look at deference, being sensitive to risks, in each jurisdiction to be sure that you're looking at the issues from, from the various different points of view, being transparent about the process and, and what works, what doesn't work and, and how you can uh, make, make things even better. Looking at flexibility to be sure that deference decisions are not straitjacketed so that if one jurisdiction gets a deference determination and then makes a change to its regulatory framework, it doesn't have to start the process all over again, assuming other things are in place, and then making sure that there is strong underlying cooperation between the jurisdictions that engage in the deference discussions. And so we took those philosophies and then came up with 11 good practices. And, and they're about those, those things, about transparency, about criteria for how you go about making an outcomes-based decision, looking at the risks and the nature of the risks, what should the level of engagement be between the entities, but also then making sure that we address the issue of revocation, because in some cases uh, an agreement may not be able to, to withstand changes 
that have uh, undergone in one jurisdiction or another. And so we put in a couple of good practices that try to address that. And our hope, our hope is that entities, jurisdictions, regulators will put these 11 good practices into place so that when they do decide to engage in the discussion about whether to defer or not defer, we've taken some of the, the friction or the, the, the angst out of how you go about doing it. Because we did find that uh, as much as we don't like to reinvent the wheel, sometimes we find that uh, uh, countries do reinvent the wheel each time. And if we can avoid that, it will make it much easier for everybody down the road. So that's the, the high level uh, approach of what we were trying to do with the report. The financial sector is very conservative, as you know. Supervision is also even more conservative than that. And there is a, uh, can you hear me? Because I saw some instability there. And uh, we often associate financial sector and supervision and all of that with uh, serious people in serious suits and looking at equations, looking at different meetings. But let's bring the people into the equation for a second. So there's a growing international consensus on the importance of climate change, financial inclusion, and gender equality. These are uh, Sustainable Development Goals 5, 8, and 13 out of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The UN, IMF, World Bank, and many national governments, central bank supervisory authorities, are focusing increasingly on these issues. A few years ago, even the FSB, Financial Stability Board, which one way or another is the parent of the standard setting bodies, launched the Task Force on Climate Disclosure Process. Given these global developments, do you believe, Carolyn and then Paul, same for you, is there also scope for international standards to focus more on the SDGs, either in core principles themselves or in accompanying, accompanying assessment criteria and related guidance? Related to that, could international standard setters provide some impetus for national supervisory authorities to take additional steps in these areas? So I'd be very interested in your views on that. Um, so I guess I'd, I'd first come back to maybe the setup of the question. And so um, the, the shift that I've noticed in these types of issues in the recent year or two and particularly in the recent six months, is um, I think people do see them as serious issues. They aren't sort of separate from the, the, the sort of traditional uh, hard numbers issues. I think people have come to appreciate, even, even before the pandemic, I think people um, in all sectors, um, and certainly in the financial sector, had definitely started to take um, certainly climate change uh, issues seriously. Um, and I think I have started to give um, hearing to some of the other um, as, as social goals. As you, you set them up, Vivek. Um, I think the thing that we're struggling with um, is our framework is naturally designed to measure things. <laughs> and we have, uh, I think, a, a, a solid, well-earned reputation for um, supporting our policy decisions with data and numbers, empirical evidence, that type of thing. And so um, you hear us often pressing for um, data. And, and, and one shouldn't mistake that for pressing for truth or show me or prove that this is an issue. I don't think that's it at all. Um, but I do think that, uh, that we do want to preserve um, the integrity of the framework by making sure that we support our policy decisions with the empirical evidence. And so I think, I, I think the real push in the next uh, several years will be to try to um, take the, the disciplines of science and social science and translate some of what they, how, how they measure things to how we measure things and to try and, and make those things uh, work in our framework. Uh, because I think at a, at a conceptual level, um, I don't know very many supervisors who don't think that these are serious issues that we need, that, that do contribute to risk. We just need help measuring them. You know, I, I, I would- Thank you very much. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. I, I think <laughs> Carolyn makes you know, great points. I mean, I think it's, it, it, it's very much not, a discussion about if, it's really about how. 
and, and for us, I would say at IOSCO, where, where we're focused is, is really a subset, I would say, of the, of the SDGs. And it's, it's really about sustainable finance, you know, for us. And I know people use the shorthand ESG for environmental and social and governance. But I think what we've, where, we, where we think we could make perhaps the greatest contribution would be in the, the climate area or the sustainable finance area. And it's taken us a little while, I would say, to get into this uh, mode about, you know, what can we do? What can capital markets regulators really do when it comes to these issues? Because, you know, we, we have a set of standards about disclosure, for example. And in many countries around the world, we all take the position that if something is a, is a material risk to investors, it needs to be disclosed, whether that's by an issuer or whether that's by an intermediary or uh, some other stakeholder, those issues have to be disclosed. But in other jurisdictions now, what I think what we're starting to see is, is when it comes at least to climate related issues, governments and other jurisdictions are saying, well, these are material per se, and therefore they have to be disclosed regardless of all the other things that are material that come to operating a particular business. And so I think what, what, what we're looking at, and we just issued a report in April um, from what we call our Sustainable Finance Network, which was put together um, across the IOSCO membership about some of these issues around disclosure. And I think what we, what we found were three you know, general themes that we're going to try to address now going forward. The first is you look across the globe and there are multiple and diverse sustainability framework, sustainability standards. And it's trying to bring some semblance of commonality and, and I hate to say order because they're all orderly, but, but commonality may be the best, uh, the best way. So that was the first set of issues that we identified. The second was that there's just a lack of common definitions about what are sustainable activities and, and how you go about achieving those and, and trying to think through uh, those types of issues are, are going to be, I think, very, very important. And then the third is really something that's near to us at IOSCO is around issues of investor protection and greenwashing and, and all, how those things really relate to what disclosures are made and what are the investor protection concerns that we should be thinking about and, and be worried about, frankly, as an organization. And so that report just came out in April and, and now we've transformed the, the, the network into a task force and the task force is going to take forward uh, a number of those issues. And I'm not sure where we will end up uh, at the end of the day because it, it's, it's, it's a little hard to tell because there is an alphabet soup of, of standards and, and, and other regulators. And, and I think one of the things that we're gonna to try to do is, is utilize our convening power to bring people together to have some discussions about what can we do and, and how can we rationalize some of these different approaches and see if there's a, if there's a feasible path forward. So we'll, we'll see, I say stay tuned. We're in the very, very early days for us at IOSCO, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that we actually made and are making some good progress in this area. Thank you, Paul and Carolyn, for sharing your views. And very soon, I'm going to go to the audience for their Q&A. And there's quite a lot of interesting questions here. But just to wrap up this part of it and this last question, uh, thank you for, for actually sharing these thoughts, because you raised some really interesting points. Carolyn, you talked about that. And Paul, you talked about these initiatives. And then basically, your convening powers are great. We are a much smaller organization than you and don't have the same global uh, you know, convening uh, authority that you have. But think of us more as a canary in the coal mine. If you are in the Vatican, we are the liberation theology on the ground, but we see a lot of these things percolating and we've done quite a lot of this work, written Toronto Center notes and guidance on supervision and dealt with some of these issues. So I'll be very happy to share some of them with you offline to the extent that you might find them uh, reasonable or you might find them uh, helpful toward the work that you do and look at us as a resource that can help you on this. So let's move to the audience. Uh, as I said, it's quite a lot of uh, questions. Let me start uh, uh, with a couple of them. Uh, oh, this is an interesting question on the um, um, business continuity aspect. So I guess this one can go to Carolyn. Has the pandemic changed the way BCSB interacts uh, or, or an IOSCO interact with one another? How about your member countries? How do they approach their responsibilities? Like, 
has the pandemic really affected anything or did you find that the systems that you had were robust enough? Yes, absolutely. So um, typically uh, the Basel committee would meet uh, here in Basel for two days every quarter. And between the end of March and last week, uh, the Basel Committee has met eight times, uh, about a half a day each time, um, and uh, and I think we are scheduled to meet twelve more times between now and the end of the year. So we're meeting way more frequently, um, uh, shorter times, but more frequently, more frequent touch points. Um, I would, I think, Paul would probably tell you, I think Osco is doing something similar, meeting sort of more often, but uh, shorter, more sort of focused meetings. Um, I'm happy to say that the other thing that has changed is the uh, contact and coordination between the standard setters. So Paul and I probably talk to each other and we talk to our colleagues at the FSB and the IIS several times a month where that might have happened maybe once a month, once every other month before. So. Lots and lots of frequent touch points, all virtually though. So, you know, we're, we're using some of the same platforms I'm sure you guys are. We're using WebEx and Teams and Zoom and, and all getting um, quite a bit more acquainted with technology. So, um, the other question I saw in the chat, I'll just answer really quickly. Somebody asked about how supervisors are doing their job in this environment. And um, particularly if we've lost the ability to do on-site examinations. And um, if you're worrying about that, you, you're in good company. Most of our members are not doing on-site inspections right now, either of their banks, and they are worrying about it. I think most of us that have been at this for a long time are good old-fashioned supervisors. We want to crack open the loan files and look the CRO in the eyes and that sort of thing. So um, definitely a lot more reliance on data. Um, I do think uh, supervisors are in contact with their banks. They're, they're using some of the same platforms. Um, but there is a lot of thinking going in right now about how do you substitute for some of the things that you used to do um, online or um, on site. So, yeah, for I could, Paul, can I echo uh, a couple of things? I mean, I, I, I mean, Carolyn put her finger on it. I mean, I, I think one of the positive. I mean, you know, you hate to think of you know positive. Uh, uh, in a di difficult situation, but I, I'm an optimistic person and I try to find the silver lining uh, in things. And to me, one of the best things that's happened with respect to the, the COVID-19 and the lockdown and, and all the virtual virtuality that we are all living with has been the interaction with, with our colleagues, you know, at the FSB, at, at, at the BCBS, at IAS, and CPMI, and, you know, the alphabet soup of, uh, of standard setting bodies. But but it has really been uh, a great uh, 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 experience and a great approach. We, we make decisions much more quickly. We, pick, we just pick up the phone and do you have five minutes for a phone call? Yes, we, and, and we resolve things in a way that uh, I think would um, not, I, I can't say would not have happened, but I think probably would have taken a bit longer to happen and evolve. Uh, whereas the pandemic kind of pushed us uh, forward. And I have to say, it's, been a, it's really been a positive development. Really. Yeah, and then, yeah, thanks. And Paul, one of the amazing, as you said, it's hard to talk about opportunities. One of the amazing opportunities of the pandemic is that we're all in it together. So we're all sitting home. We're all facing with things. And of course, the workload has increased a lot, but you understand the importance of reaching out. So thank you for that. Yeah. Paul, we have a couple of questions here. Um, they're asking you to please list the good practices you refer to in your document. So, I mean, maybe you can touch on it at a very high level, but also you can maybe guide Toronto Center offline, send an email to me or to Demet so that we can distribute it to the participants. So could you please list those a little bit? Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to certainly send you a link uh, uh, with that. And one of, the, one of the nice things we do uh, with reports now that we publish is uh, – the, the, the good practices are embodied in the document and it's a 20, 22 page, 25 page document. But at the end, it's two pages. If you just want to go to the good practices themselves, they're two pages. And what, what the report tries to do is list not only the good practices, but pr provide some guidance about what we really mean when we talk about looking at the, the, the like the first one, for example, it, it, it talks about trying to come up with the most appropriate 
arrangements for ensuring transparency. And so we list then a number of things about how you could go about doing that. So it could be, you know, you set up a, a, a weekly phone call or at the very beginning, you, you exchange documentation, legislative texts, guidance, you know, those kinds of things, making sure that you, you agree on basic things like language, believe it or not. Sometimes we found that in, in, in our work that there was not even an agreement on the use of a common language. And so what we were finding is people were exchanging texts of, of, of laws, but one was in one language and the other was in another language. And so there was a lot of cross sort of talking. So, so the first set of, of, of uh, good practices are, are really around uh, transparency and then how you go about doing an outcomes-based assessment. So it could be, you need to look at the, the, the legal frameworks and what are the criteria for uh, assessing whether uh, a, 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 an entity or another jurisdiction should be deferred to. What, what is, what's the, the nature of the oversight in that particular jurisdiction when it comes to markets, investor protection, you know, those kinds of things. And so um, I, I, I hate to sort of take our time and, 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 and read, you know, all 11 uh, good practices, uh, but I, I, I think providing the link and then maybe perhaps you can distribute that might be uh, a, a more uh, effective use of time. Not that I don't want to talk about them. I'm, I'm very proud of this report. We spent a lot of time working on it and uh, I put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it personally. So I'm very pleased with the report, but I know we have uh, a number of other things probably to, to talk about as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And we'd be very happy to distribute it and no shame in uh, putting some commercials for IOSCO or BCP <laughs> in, in here. So, um, Carolyn, uh, let me put you on the spot. I mean, I'm, I'm not, this uh, questioner is doing. Most supervisors uh, uh, or, or institutions suspended distribution of dividends to be paid in 2020. Do you think that this measure should also be extended in 2021? <laughs> That's a tough one. There's a few tough ones in the, in the Q&A function there. Um, so I think different supervisors have taken in a different approach to this. The Basel framework has some built-in distribution restrictions, um, but some of our members have chosen to trigger them earlier than they would otherwise have occurred in the capital stack. Um, I think you have to take a few things into account if you're a supervisor and you're thinking about this. Uh, one is, um, what is the capital cushion your banks have? Um, how, how, how much capital conservation, how early um, do you want that to occur? Um, uh, but you do also have to think about a bank's ability to raise capital later in the crisis if they need to. So I think that consideration, um, how profitable is your bank? What's their ability to, what are their other alternatives to build back that capital? Um, but you know what our members, some of our members who have chosen not to restrict dividends are saying, look, our, our banks are healthy. Um, they're profitable, the, the distribution restrictions are built into the framework, they were transparent to the investors at the time, um, our banks have a solid capital plan, we've stress tested them, we think there's room, and uh, they've, so they haven't just, you know, neglected the issue, they've made a considered decision for, for what I think are valid reasons. Uh, likewise, other members of the Basel Committee um, have opted to um, to restrict those dividends. I think you know part of the issue too is what do your banks? How do your banks distribute capital? Is it dividends? Is it share buybacks? So I think you have to be careful to compare apples to apples here too when you're looking at cross jurisdictions on this issue. Thank you. And Paul, uh, I want to pass on this question to you. And before we do that, we just have a nice. Uh, I want to give a nice shout out to. Daki Ladao from uh, Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome to everyone, so we welcome you back, thank you. So Paul, back to you. Um, the questioner talks about both BC, uh, BS, and IOSCO, but let's just focus on, yeah, let's just uh, ask what you think. Have BCSB and IOSCO, in your case IOSCO, developed a plan for removing the current uh, forbearance introduced due to COVID-19? Well, you know, it's, a, it's, it's actually a very interesting question because we're going through sort of an exercise right now as part of uh, working with uh, our colleagues at the Financial Stability Board. 
about the issues around flexibility and, and, and what have been good practices, what's been the assessment of that and, and, and whatnot. And the good news from an IOSCO point of view is that the way we write our principles, our recommendations, our standards, there, there is sort of built in flexibility already. And, and, and one of the reasons we do it that way is because we have over 150 jurisdictions that we're trying to build consensus with when it comes to implementing and, and promulgating uh, international international standards and and uh, guide, guidelines and, and things of that nature. And so by the very nature of that, what we do can't, cannot be very prescriptive. So in, the, in a time of COVID-19, we were able to sort of rely on a number of those flexible uh, flexibility uh, mechanisms that we already have built in. And so to the direct answer to the question is, we, we don't really have a plan to say, oh, no more flexibility on recommendations when it comes to liquidity risk management. We're not going to do that because the, the, the way the standard was written in the first place was to account for different times, different places, different circumstances, different jurisdictions, different entities that allow for uh, the use of, of, of the, the, the way we, uh, the flexibility that, that's sort of built in. And I think that's the beauty of being a standard setting, setting body internationally is, is at least in IOSCO's point of view, you can be a little more uh, high level. And, and that suited us, suited us quite well. Thank you. And Carolyn, do you have anything to add to this question? I think Paul's done a good job. Um, I think, um, I don't know that we, I can say that we've really had a thorough conversation yet about the path out. We keep talking about the fact that we're going to need to, but I think right now we're still feeling like we're in the eye of the storm. But. Just saying, uh, it's actually a very reasonable perspective as well. I mean, uh, it's good to do planning for that, but uh, as we were looking at the naming this series, we thought about reopening, we thought about recovery, and we thought both of them, given all the deaths and destruction that we're seeing is kind of insensitive. And frankly, a lot of countries are going and coming back and the virus is surging. So we're really in a new normal right now. And we're still going through the yeah. eye of the storm. So maybe it's, it is a little bit too early. Uh, but I think, it, 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 yeah. Uh, what I was gonna say is um, it's a little bit different too. I mean, maybe the difference between um, uh, Paul's uh, remit and mine, I think, the way we're looking at it is the impact to the banking sector, at least, has been delayed a lot by the fiscal interventions, the, the guarantee programs, the deferral programs and stuff. And so I, I think we're still, um, you know, there, there was a pretty severe market volatility um, at the beginning. So the capital markets took a really early hit in terms of um, uh, volatility and stress. Uh, the, the banking sector, though, so far, I think I think we have the worst to come. So, let me read this question and see which of you is interested in taking it on. Um, and I may just volunteer one of you if. Uh, let's see if I, I volunteered Carolyn already, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can. Yeah, you can go. So, considering the uh, projected unpleasant economic and financial impacts of COVID nineteen globally, and particularly how these will affect financial institutions. Should we uh, expect reviews of existing standards of Basel and IOSCO? If there will be such reviews, to, that, to what extent will these reviews uh, be take place? So, Paul, do you want to take a crack at that? Uh, no, I'm happy to uh, to take a, to take a crack at that. I mean, I, I would say there's probably two or three areas where we're probably going to have to take a look, given where things have uh, unfold or how things have unfolded with COVID-19. The first, and we're already started on this, so that's the good news, is, is around some recommendations we put in some years ago around money market funds and how those money market funds have performed. And that was uh, certainly a, a, a difficult area when it came to COVID-19. Because in many, in many countries, the money market fund industry essentially froze up. And in the U.S., it was a difficult uh, time until the Fed came in and, and, and loosened, the, 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 the greased the wheels a little bit with, with some of its uh, uh, interventions. And so I think our review is going to look at those recommendations we did. And frankly, are they still fit for purpose? And we went through a, a, a live stress test through COVID-19. And how did we fare? So that's an area we're definitely going to have to take a look at. The other area uh, is, is, is around business continuity planning. 
Now, we had issued some recommendations uh, a couple, just a, two or three years ago, really, around business continuity plans for markets and for intermediaries. And again, we've been through a live stress test. And I think looking at how those business continuity recommendations have held up in light of COVID-19 will be a good exercise for us because we may need to make some tweaks to those uh, and, and create different expectations given, given where we ended up. So those would be a couple of areas I think we're gonna probably have to take a look and see whether or not uh, we need to make some changes. Thank you. And Carolyn, this next question goes to you. Uh, it's a very good question, perhaps a bit tough. And uh, th talk about profiles encouraged. They said anonymous attendee asking, right? So anyway, <laughs> so B BCSB and IOSCO have published guidance on the use of flexibility by banks when applying accounting standards IFRS 9 to payment holidays. But while it is easy for regulators to say that such flexibility is available, it is much more difficult for supervisors to check whether banks are using this flexibility consistently, prudently, and sensibly. Have you just created a minefield here that will lead to some banks uh, making insufficient provisions? <laughs> yeah. So, um, look, I think uh, IFRS 9, your expected credit loss, uh, is fundamentally a model. And we just went through a whole bunch of work in Basel III to try to uh, um, moderate bank stability to use models in unhelpful ways. Um, and then we've gone and introduced a pretty important model, one that, one that, uh, that guides provisioning. And I think uh, long before COVID, uh, we, were, we were worried about uh, the first downturn for this model. Um, all models benefit from uh, historical data, practice, using them, being through a cycle or two, knowing how they operate. Um, and we knew that the first downturn under this new model was going to be uh, difficult. And then, of course, we have sort of the, the mother of all downturns. So, so I, think, I think it will be difficult. It is going to be a big job for supervisors to stay on top of banks provisioning models. Um, particularly now, um, uh, but I think it's important for us to remember why we have ECL and what it replaced. Um, you know, I hear a lot of hand-wringing about the cyclicality of ECL, and I think, I think we have to be careful. I mean, the incurred, but the incurred loss model was also pro-cyclical, um, so I think there's a certain amount of provisioning that is by its nature are going to be cyclical because bank lending is cyclical, uh, credit markets are cyclical. Um, so I don't know that there's a, a better mouse trap out there. So I think we have to use the one that we have as wisely as we can, and that's going to take really, really solid supervision. Thank you very much for that. And Paul, over to you, another question from uh, Anonymous. <laughs> uh, and this actually speaks to the global reach of your organization. Like you have uh, uh, growth in emerging markets and uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, components, fabulous components to IOSCO. So one size does not fit all when it comes to IOSCO. What are uh, uh, your views on the application of standards uh, core principles when it comes to mature markets versus emerging, even frontier markets? What should the drivers be to reduce what the participants are calling compliance burdens? Is this simple fact that a market promotes buyer beware and therefore requires disclosure enough for a regulator to be comfortable with potential investor losses? I'm sure that's the kind of stuff that you talk with and deal with all the time. Any views on that? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a couple of components to that question I, as I see it. I mean, you know, I started at IOSCO four years ago plus. And when I first came in, there was this, I would say, divide. In, in views that there were emerged or advanced market country issues and there were emerging market country issues. And we had to sort of keep the two separate because they were different. And I think, you know, I don't know, I'm not prescient or anything, but, but I will say that in the first six months or thereabouts, I started scratching my head and saying, you know, what are we, we're worried about cybersecurity. We're worried about investor protection. We're worried about issues around market integrity. 
these are not advanced market issues and emerging market issues. These are market issues. These are regulatory supervisory enforcement issues. And so we start, we, we in effect, stop sort of making this, this divide, you know, between corporate governance and, and, and things that we thought were just emerging market country issues and started looking at it, things a little more holistically. And by doing that, we would bring in, let's say, the emerging market perspective on a particular standard. So it could be around liquidity, uh, risk management, or it could be around business continuity, those kinds of things. And so in, in the fashioning of the recommendations that we would issue, we would try to be mindful of the fact that, yes, these do, in some respects, have applicability in all sorts of contexts and markets and circumstances. And so that's why we tried to build in the flexibility. That's one component of, of the question. But the other component of the question is where there is a huge need, I would say, when it comes to emerging market countries is around market development. And this is a theme we hear a lot because many regulators around the world, and, and not just from emerging markets, but other uh, emerged and, and uh, middle tier markets as well, have a mandate to develop the market in addition to regulating and overseeing and enforcing. And so we spend some time thinking about how can our standards and recommendations be used to help develop the markets for those countries and those jurisdictions where it's a mandate. And I'll give you one quick example because I know we're running short on time, which is around a topic we talked about just a couple of minutes ago, which was around sustainable finance. So it's an issue for all markets, no matter what, but what our GEM committee did, our Growth and Emerging Markets Committee did, was come up with a series of recommendations about how to look at sustainable finance from a market development point of view and what could be done, and not just by emerging markets, but it was focused on emerging markets, using green finance as a, man, as a manner and a mode to develop the market. And, and we think that looking at things sort of from those vantage points will suit all of us quite well because the issues are for everyone, but there are some certain and there are peculiarities that do apply to emerging markets that we at, at IASCO have to be very, very sensitive and mindful of. Thank you. And we're really coming close to the end. So uh, one, of the way, one of the reasons why we do have a following and people attend our webinars is because we try to keep time. It basically comes as simple to be as simple as that. So uh, at this point, I'd like to thank both of you. You were very generous with your time and uh, very uh, frank with your answers. And some of these questions were um, not that easy and we still have a couple of questions left on the table and I apologize and we will try our best to respond to those or keep it as part of our series. Uh, we are contemplating what to do with these 14 or so webinars that uh, we have conducted because they were conducted during a very, very difficult time period since the pandemic was declared. A lot of very interesting insights came out of that. And uh, we will reach out to you, Carolyn and Paul, for some follow-up at some point in the future. But for now, really want to thank you. And uh, I hope that we can see you at another Toronto Centre program or through another kind of an engagement. So uh, again, thanks again and have a great time. And as I said, you really kicked ass. Take care. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everybody.